You're ready to go forward? Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Timothy Driscoll, and with my co-counsel, Garrett Atherton, we represent the petitioner, Elizabeth Duraliman. I, I will argue the Fourth Amendment issues in this case, and Mr. Atherton will address Federal Rule of Evidence 106. At this time, I would like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. The government conducted two unconstitutional searches in its investigation of Ms. Duraliman. First, when it invaded her reasonable expectation of privacy and accessed her medical information from 23andU.com, and later, when she entered the border at Dulles International Airport and the government performed a forensic, non-routine search of her cell phone without reasonable suspicion. I will address the 23andU search first. Under this court's CATS doctrine, the government performs a search when it intrudes upon an area that an individual seeks to preserve as private and when society deems that expectation reasonable. So counsel, is it, is it, what's the nature of this search that would require a search warrant? So let's say um, the government runs DNA through that database. Do they need a, a search warrant to do that? They want, they want to identify someone. They have an, uh, an unidentified DNA sample. They run it through the database. Search warrant or no search warrant? No search warrant, Your Honor. So what is it that makes this different? Isn't it identification? What makes this different, Your Honor, is this court's holding in Maryland versus King, uh, where the court went on at length about how searches incident to arrest, uh, your diminished expectation of privacy in that instance allows the government to take a cheek swab using your DNA for what is effectively a hyper-accurate fingerprint. But at the end of that opinion, the court notes that medical information is different, that if the court, or excuse me, if the government were to use medical information uh, to identify someone, that that runs and inherent risks to your privacy or expectation of privacy under the Fourth Amendment. But aren't you ignoring the difference between a search incident to arrest and a border search? There are different considerations that allow the government to search at the border without reasonable suspicion and certainly without probable cause. How do you, how do you justify that? Justice Pollack, that reflects the uh, difference about the search with respect to Ms. Duralman's cell phone. Uh, what I'm addressing now is the DNA evidence that the government uh, received from 23andU.com. Um, Ms. Duralman's expectation of privacy is informed by this court's holdings, uh, for example, in Ferguson versus City of Charleston, as well as federal statutes such as... But to what extent, though, is the analysis subjective instead of objective on the first prong of the CATS analysis? Justice Few, traditionally, the, the Katz analysis has two prongs. First is the subjective prong, uh, but Justice Thomas's dissent... And subjectively, she deliberately told the company to whom she gave her DNA that they had permission to sell the information without her consent. Justice Few, it's true that Ms. Duralman checked the box allowing 23andU to share her data with third parties who paid for it. Uh, the user agreement doesn't seem to suggest that they would share that information with the police. And so to the extent that this court's third party doctrine has to do with knowing waiver, uh, Mr. Allman wasn't made aware of the fact that her DNA would be made available to law enforcement. But that's not where... Are you suggesting that if the government had paid for it, that would be okay? Certainly that seems to fit within the, the contract she signed. Not at all, Your Honor. I was just about to say that that doesn't even control here, though, because the box Ms. Duralman checked said that 23andU could share her data with those who paid for it. And from whether it be from HIPAA, though admittedly 23andU is not subject to HIPAA, services, whether doctor's offices or otherwise, that give medical information are allowed to share that information as long as it's stripped of its personally identifying information or anonymized. But she gave this information to this website. She checked the consent box. What's the expectation of privacy there? 
just they're not going to give it to the government? I mean, I don't know of a case that says it's limited in that way. Your Honor, the, the limitation or, or her reasonable expectation of privacy has to do with the data being anonymized, because that's what services do when they share personally identifying medical information. It's sensitive data. Um, that's what medical providers are allowed to do under HIPAA. And that's what we expect will happen when we check the box saying you can share my data. Earlier you told me, I think, that I wouldn't need a search warrant if I wanted to identify someone through their DNA. So isn't that an identification as well? It's not the anonymity of it. Your Honor, it's the anonymity of, of a medical diagnosis. And this court's holding in Carpenter, which moves toward limiting the third party doctrine as it had been understood until Carpenter, uh, has to do with the sensitivity of the data that the government is able to collect given evolving technologies. Uh, in, in Carpenter, it seems to me, a lot of the Carpenter decision was based on how often, how intrusive is it in terms of how I locate somebody, um, the amount of data, and there's a footnote in Carpenter saying, we don't know how this applies, you know, how many times do you ask? How much data are you asking for? I think there are a lot of open questions in Carpenter. So how is this like Carpenter? It's really one shot of information. The government's going in there to identify someone. And I, I, I'm having a hard time seeing the analogy to the Carpenter case. It's, it's like Carpenter for this reason, Your Honor. Carpenter is about the, the quality of sensitive information that the government can learn from you based on your cell site location information. Uh, there's nothing more sensitive than our uh, health information. Uh, indeed, that is one of the sort of fundamental privacy interests uh, that each of us hold, and again, that this court recognized in, uh, in Ferguson versus City of Charleston. Um, in, in Carpenter as well, the opinion for the court noted that sharing information with a third party does not automatically sever uh, the protections of the Fourth Amendment, that it has to do with the quality of the information that's shared with the third party. But if she had had a glass of wine at the bar, right, and left her DNA on that glass, would that not be the same? In other words, they would be able to get the same information about her DNA and about her uh, physical con condition from, from that, and you wouldn't need a warrant for that, right? Your Honor, you're absolutely correct. You wouldn't need a warrant for that. But I disagree about the information you would glean from that. And that is reflected in this court's opinion in Maryland versus King, uh, where you can use DNA information consistent with the Fourth Amendment as a hyper-accurate fingerprint. But there, the, the opinion for the court discussed the risks that arise when it's used to detect a, an illness that someone may have a predisposition for or already so, has. So, but, but the DNA is there. It gets analyzed, right? Whether it's analyzed through the glass or through the submission that she's voluntarily given. Where is the, where's the distinction about the medical condition? It's going to show up no matter what, right? I disagree, Your Honor. What will show up is the person's uh, saliva that ended up on the glass matches the DNA that was left at the crime scene, for example. Uh, what won't show up is, and that person happens to have HIV. Now, I think HIV is, shows that is an example of a, of a particularly sensitive diagnosis that we don't want the government to have access to, and that a holding for the government in this case would allow the government to, to potentially find sensitive medical information about individuals uh, and identify them through that. With Your Honor's permission, I'd like to go to the border search. Before, I'm sorry. Well, let me ask a question before you go. Let's flip to the second prong of the CATS test. And you um, have to be able to articulate that, that this is a level of, of privacy that, the government, that, that society is willing to acknowledge and accept and recognize. And the factual scenario of this, the way this arose, seems to me to pose problems for you because it's not like the law enforcement went to the to the, um, the company and said, give me all the information you have on this specific person, but rather went and said, we have a, what we believe to be a national security moment here. We overheard this conversation about uh, trading um, sensitive documents and, and we have a unique way of being able to identify who's involved. All we want is the name of the person. With that, with that difference, talk to me about why it is that, w that, that we should look at society and say we're, society will not tolerate uh, 
this level of disclosure? Well, Your Honor, society is not willing to disclose sensitive medical information. So whether that's in the context of the government asking uh, politely from a, a service like 23andU or demanding it uh, via subpoena, this court in Carpenter, for example, didn't make a distinction between, say, subpoenaed evidence uh, and evidence voluntarily overturned by a third party, uh, if I'm understanding your question. Uh, moreover, the, in Kylo, this court articulated a principle that the Fourth Amendment's protections don't shrink uh, by, because of evolving technologies. And whereas in the past, uh, Ms. Duralamin may have had to go to a doctor or medical provider to obtain a diagnosis of Ashwell's disease, because of evolutions in technology, she's able to obtain that from an online service like 23andU. The, the protections of the Fourth Amendment shouldn't shrink because of this new technology. Uh, but I would like to turn to the, the border search uh, of Mr. Alleman's cell phone. In Montoya de Hernandez, this court held that non-routine border searches require a reasonable suspicion. And counsel, I, I, I understand your adversary's position. It's, you know, that's very different. It's personally intrusive. Um, and that's a pretty clear rule to me, you know, that a border agent could apply. So it's personally intrusive, Montoya, it's, it's a non-routine. What would your test for a non-routine search be? Your Honor, to first address the question of what can border agents be able to apply, uh, in the Fourth Circuit in United States v. Coles cited uh, Customs and Border Patrol policy that says forensic searches of electronic devices like cell phones and computers uh, are non-routine uh, and that they require additional suspicion. So the Fourth Circuit looked at that and said, well, this means that Customs and Border Patrol, one, thinks that such a policy is consistent with their prerogative of protecting the nation and preventing the inflow of contraband, and two, that it's a manageable distinction that, that Border Patrol agents are able to make. To answer your question about where the line should be drawn, uh, Riley versus California is informative in this context. The court wrote at length about what makes smartphones unique in modern American life and even called the, self, the cell phone a sort of part of the, the everyday American's anatomy. Now, the problem I have with Riley is that's a search incident to arrest, right? Yes. Those are the facts? Sure. So I'm making a search incident to arrest. I take the phone. If I can't search it right there, incident to arrest, the agent will put it in an evidence locker, go to a magistrate and say, you know, I arrested a drug courier, there's evidence usually on phones, whatever, and likely get a search warrant. But I'm at the border, and now I have to make a decision. Can I keep this phone and look at it, or, or do I have to give it back, essentially, and you go off? So isn't there a very different dynamic there? Your Honor, I, I grant you there is a different dynamic, but the reasonable suspicion standard is not so heightened uh, that border agents won't be able to apply it. it that applies to a great number of people. In the three circuit court cases, the 14th Circuit noted in its opinion below, uh, an 11th Circuit state Tosit, courses in the 4th Circuit, and Cotterman in the 9th Circuit, uh, though the circuits differed on whether reasonable suspicion was necessary for forensic searches of electronic devices, they all held that there was reasonable suspicion for the defendants in those cases. But it, it seems to me the risk when you take something incident to arrest is a physical risk to the officer, right? The risk at the border is more of a national security type risk, potentially. So when I make that decision, you know, I have a phone, what's really the risk personally to the arresting agent or officer? But I have something at the border, if I can't look in it, it goes. And maybe the risk is in that phone. <clears throat> Your Honor, the test simply can't be that no contraband or no uh, object that, that the United States government can, wants to keep out of the country, it can, always can. Uh, were that the test at the border, uh, then the kind of cavity search or, or ex excuse me, rectal exam that was at issue in Montoya de Hernandez would also be routine because people crossing the border can keep contraband in their digestive tract easily and, and don't require and if, if the government wasn't required to have heightened suspicion, uh, then indeed Customs and Border Patrol would be able to prevent the influx of a lot of narcotics. What if it's not password protected? Can I look in the phone? Your Honor, I see my time ex has expired. May I answer your question? You may. If the, if the 
cell phone isn't password protective, then what the Border Patrol agent would conduct is a manual search of the phone. And indeed, the Customs and Border Patrol policy that I cited to you earlier uh, makes a distinction between forensic searches, the kind here, which produced over 900 pages of uh, Mr. Alleman's cell phone history, and for manual searches, which only go through uh, the sort of easily accessible information on a phone. Uh, that's the kind of search that would happen here, and Customs and Border Patrol calls that routine, and we don't disagree with that. I reserve the remainder of your t my time. Your Mr. Chief Justice, Justices, Garrett Atherton for the petitioner, Elizabeth Jeralmon. I will be discussing Federal Rule of Evidence 106. Your Honors, when the District Court uh, denied Ms. Jeralmon's uh, request to admit the remaining portions of Marin Rapstall's statement, it abused its discretion. When the inculpatory portions of Marin Rapstall's conversation with Agent Rimson are removed from the exculpatory portions, the context changes. And the District Court recognized this on page uh, <laughs> Uh, 42 of the record on lines 10 and 11. But, and they, but looking at the rule, the rule is clear. It talks about written or recorded statements. I don't see the word oral statements, and that's what we're talking about here. So this court has the power to apply the law to oral statements. Although the text of Rule 106 says writings and recordings, and Congress has the ability to pass statutes, this court also has the inherent judicial power to craft common law and sometimes to engraft that common law onto the text of Congress's statutes and rules to give them form and shape and to fill in the gaps and interstices among them. But you're really asking us to rewrite the rule because Congress clearly could have said any statements, oral, written, recorded, it did not. This court has not shied away from abusing that, or from using that power, <laughs> Your Honor, in other uh, contexts of the federal rules of evidence. For example, in Green v. Bach Laundry, the court uh, addressed rule of evidence 609A, as it was then written, which said that courts have to weigh the prejudicial effect of the introduction of past felonies against a defendant. The court realized that might make sense if the Congress had been talking about criminal defendants because they enjoy special procedural protections that the prosecution and civil litigants do not. But it didn't make any sense at all to distinguish between civil defendants and civil plaintiffs. So this court decided it was going to read Rule 609A as if it said criminal in the text. The court did that again in United States v. Able, in which it decided that uh, parties can introduce uh, extrinsic evidence to impeach a witness for bias, even though that's mentioned nowhere in the text of the federal rules of evidence. In the United States v. Tomei, this court decided that the old common law rule, which said that a prior inconsistent statement had to have been made before a motive for making that statement had arisen, still applied in the federal rules of evidence, even though it's mentioned nowhere in the text. I, I, I don't. Go ahead. I don't doubt that we have the power to do that, but isn't there a, a really good reason why Congress could have decided to limit it? to written or recorded statements. They're more accurate. A conversation that I had 15 minutes ago with uh, my fellow justices, I may be remembering pieces of it, but there's no accuracy to it. Whereas if it's recorded, correct, or written down, it's something that can be very easily checked. So the court does have the, uh you may be referring to the fact that the advisory committee notes state that there might be some practical reasons why Congress chose to depart from the common law rule. It doesn't say what those practical reasons are. Some lower courts have attempted to explain that, and they usually settle upon the idea that it's impossible to know when the beginning of a conversation started and when the end, start, uh, end occurred. They're not finite. They don't have four corners like a document. And if one party were to in introduce part of a writing or recording, the other party could simply read the rest of that document into the record. That concern, at the very least, is not present in this case because the entirety of the remaining portion of the conversation, the oral statement that we would like to have admitted, is memorialized in Agent Rimson's 302 statement. And that can easily be verified by the court in a, using a, a Rule 104A, despite because it doesn't have... Uh, we accept this idea that, that the explanatory portion of the statement doesn't have to come from the same writing. What's the end point of that? Why wouldn't someone be able to come back and say, I would like to explain the context of this by giving you a conversation that occurred 90 days later? So under your theory, what's the difference? There, there is no difference between writings and recordings with regard to that concern, Justice View. 
the text of the rule as it stands now and is applied to writings and recordings says not just portions of one document, but related documents. And this court ha has always used that to uh, apply to something like a letter and the reply to the letter. This court did that in Crawford v. United States. In 1909, the defendant received a letter that accused him of spoliating evidence. And he replied there, to that. Now, you, now you've tapped into this practical concern thing. If we open this, cracked up this door just a little bit, then you got trial judges, district judges, state court judges around the country constantly during the course of a trial trying to balance whether they should allow the cross-examining counsel to interject some other fact that was not part of the direct examining counsel's approach simply to keep things in context. Yes, Your Honor. And, and that's a practical problem. It, 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 it may uh, increase the workload of, of some district judges, but fairness requires this, and that's the, the, uh, the lodestar of Rule 106 and has been the, the objective of, rule, of the common law rule of completeness. Uh, Counsel, it seems to me you have, you have two hurdles here, right? You have the written oral hurdle, and you have otherwise admissible, right? So part of the argument, as I understand it, is you look at 106 and you look at 611, and if you don't read 106 in a certain way, 611 is somewhat redundant, right? That's part of your argument. They may overlap. The drafters of the federal rules of evidence put lots of belts and suspenders into, into the rules to make but sure. As I understood your argument, it was if you don't read 106 this way, they will overlap. So 106 has to mean more than just the order of proof. Wasn't that part of your argument? 106 does have what's called the trumping function. The common law rule of completeness has always had that, at least dating back to the uh, United States v. Crawford v. United States. But what I'm, I'm getting at here is so I've been thinking about how do you make those two rules consistent. And one of the thoughts I had looking at the rules of evidence is what if it doesn't, if 106 applies to written and oral, but only written, written gets you, I'm sorry, 106 applies only written and recorded. And under 106, you can have otherwise inadmissible evidence come in. But for oral complete, to, to make statements complete under an oral statement theory, you need to use 611. And under 611, you don't trump the hearsay rules, for example. Wouldn't that make them consistent? Some uh, di uh, federal district, uh, some lower federal courts and courts of appeals have said that Rule 106, somehow in combination with Rule 611A, does provide the trumping function. Others point to the, the common law un, standing on its own weight. This court in Beach Aircraft v. Rainey said that the no, but, but I think what I'm asking you is why does an oral statement just go under 611? And a written statement goes under 106. And then the problem for you then would be, I think under 611, it doesn't trump anything. And all you get is a completeness kind of order of proof argument. But under 106, if you had a written statement and a recorded statement, then you could have a, you know, for example, you could overcome a hearsay objection. One way or another, uh, fairness requires that oral statements that are necessary to recontextualize unfairly edited statements for, uh, have to come in in the face of admissibility objections, whether this court chooses to group that under 106 or under, under 611A or under the common law. Uh, My way, outside. given the concerns about oral statements, wouldn't that be a better rule? Because if you have a written or recorded statement, it's easier to do a completeness function. Maybe you could overcome a hearsay objection and an otherwise inadmissible problem. But with an oral statement, you could only use it to, for this completeness rule under 611, and then you wouldn't be able to overcome an inadmissibility problem. Fairness may require that the rule is read that way. For example, this, this situation is redolent of the concerns that motivated this court in Chambers v. Uh, Mississippi, where a defendant couldn't uh, get his uh, hearsay into the record uh, because of the state's uh, rules of evidence. This court said that rules of evidence have to give way when criminal uh, proceedings uh, jeopardize the rights that are protected uh, by the con Constitution, the confrontation right. That's at issue in this case. Marin Rapstall's dead. But his statements are being used testimonially against Mr. Alamon. She has to, if he were alive, they probably would have called him and she'd be able to cross-examine him. Her Fifth Amendment right is also implicated here. In the United States v, uh, or I'm sorry, in Griffin v. California, this court said that there are just certain things that the prosecution can't say to the jury that would put pressure on the defendant's uh, uh, choice not to take the stand in their own defense, that that price was just too high. 
that price is too high here as well. The analog, though, is not that there are certain statements that the prosecution can't put before the jury, but there are certain pieces of evidence that they can't put before the jury that would force Mr. Alamon to sacrifice her Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. For example, because what she's, the situation that she faces now is that she can either choose to let the unfair inference lie, or she can give up the right that is sacrosanct in the Fifth Amendment to rebut that. Or she can bring this up on cross-examination. Well, only if she's allowed to access the hearsay, Your Honor, and that's exactly what this court uh, said that the defendant in Chambers v. Mississippi was able to do. This, the confrontation right also motivated this. So, so uh, if we were to say that uh, the timing of it is not so important, then you wouldn't have to focus on the, you, you would need only to focus on whether the inadmissibility part of it is, uh, whether or not Rule 106 can trump the inadmissibility. Yes, if you're going if to If we say that that's, if we say that, that it does, then all of your constitutional concerns are taken care of? If you are willing to give us that Rule 106 applies to oral statements and you want to move on to whether it allows the admission of hearsay, uh, we'd be happy to talk about that. No, I was saying if we tell you that you can bring up this contextual uh, examination on cross rather than at the time the original statement is offered, uh, would that take care of your constitutional concerns? No, because uh, the, the, rule, the common law rule of completeness always uh, provided for contemporaneous admission. In fact, that's Rule 106 states in the advisory committee notes that it's based on two considerations, one of which is that the inadequacy of repair may be uh, caused by delay. Sometimes cross-examination takes place days or weeks after a direct examination, depending on the uh, length and complexity of the trial. And sometimes that can be better, because then on cross-examination, you get to leave the jury with what you want the jury to hear. But sometimes you may have to reconstruct the original conversation as well and waste the court's time. I would like to direct the court's uh, attention to Bruton v. the United States, which is an interesting example. In that case, no motivated by confrontation concerns, this court uh, realized that sometimes when a criminal defendant makes self-inculpatory statements and non-self-inculpatory statements, but chose not to testify in his own defense and was therefore immune from cross-examination, those statements had to be edited. This, that's the converse of what's taken place. Isn't that what they did here? I mean, the prosecution, I think, was fairly careful, cagey. They never used anything about your client. It's, what happened is that they went too far in the opposite direction. Here, a uh, very tact tactically and strategically edited and redacted statement gave a false impression. And this court has explained, as in Bruton, that the editing of statements that... Uh, but wouldn't they have had a Bruton problem if they used your client's name? They would have had a Bruton problem because then you would have had a non-testifying witness. No, it's not a Bruton problem because they're also not joint defendants. What I, what I cite that for is the proposition that this court is aware of the fact that statements that are partially self-inculpatory and partially non-self-inculpatory have to be edited properly for fairness sake. Would you have had a confrontation problem if they used the name? What they, what they should have done is uh, the prosecution faces a choice in this case. They, they have to prove... Uh, Mr. Alamon's mental state. The mens rea is a crucial element for their case. They attempt to do so by proving the mental state of Mr. Rapstall, although he's not on trial, in a way that's highly suggestive that Mr. Alamon shares his mental state. But they, they could have chosen to prove that in a different way if they have other evidence. And the consideration that they should have made is we should either face the, the risk that if we put this in, the, uh, the inculpatory statements, the court is going to honor Rule 106 and allow for the entire statement to come in. If we're not willing to, willing to risk that, we may not want to put in any of Marin Rapstall's statements to uh, Agent Rimson, and we may seek to prove the mens rea in another fashion. <clears throat> the, uh, I, I want to return to the common law as it stands on its own. This court in Beach Aircraft v. Rainey said that it didn't have to reach the issue of whether Rule 106 applied in that case. It said that the common law had only been partially codified and that it was still operative. If that vehicle is available to Mr. Almon, uh, the court should have uh, exercised its discretion to allow her to put in the remainder of Marin Rapstall's statement to uh, Agent Rimson. Was that a criminal case, though? It's not. And what's interesting isn't about that, it... Isn't that a significant difference here? This would make it even more necessary that uh, the remaining portion of the uh, evidence were admitted and so that the, because as I mentioned earlier, criminal defendants enjoy heightened protection. In that case, the, this court allowed the uh, evidence to be brought in under another form of admissibility objection, independent, uh, inappropriate opinion testimony, not hearsay. 
So for these reasons, Your Honor, we request that the 14th Circuit's holding be reversed. Before you sit down, I can't read your name tag. What's your team number, please? 14. Thank you. Good evening, Your Honors. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Laura Anderson, and I, along with my co-counsel, Miranda Rowley, represent the respondent in this case, the United States of America. Today, I'll be addressing the government's acquisition of Ms. Geralaman's genetic identification, along with the search of her cell phone at the United States border. My co-counsel will then address why the full context of Mr. Rapstall's statement was properly excluded at trial. When it comes to combating crime, tying the hands of law enforcement risks opening the floodgates to dangerous, technologically adept criminals who could abuse the system. Accordingly, respondent respectfully requests that this court affirm the decision of the 14th Circuit Court of Appeals for two reasons. Exactly what would these dangerous criminals be bringing into the country on their cell phones that they couldn't email in? Your Honor, that concern brings me to the second portion of this argument, which is the search of Ms. Geralaman's cell phone at the United States border. Here, the record reflects on pages 5 and 10 that Ms. Geralaman was found with evidence of text message conversations suggesting an illegal exchange for hacked information from a congressional campaign. And beyond that, Your Honor, this court has also addressed concerns related to terrorism threats as well as child pornography. But, but, but you changed the subject. What, what is it that you could bring in, that one could bring in on a cell phone that, that couldn't be emailed into the country? Your Honor, whether or not an information or a piece of information could be emailed or transported on the device itself is a separate question for this court to consider because regardless of if a person could access the information via email, if they do choose to bring it in on that particular device, they are still subjected to a search at the United States border. But it seems the standard here that they want to apply is re they're suggesting is reasonable suspicion, right? So it's not probable cause. That is true, Your Honor. It's not a very high standard, right? Correct, Your Honor. So if you're going to do a full body cavity search or you're going to take somebody's phone for 16 days and, and keep it and put their information on your investigative databases, is that really a high standard to impose? Perhaps it is a lower standard than probable cause, Your Honor, but it is still too high in this instance when we balance the government's national security interest against the privacy interests of the traveler. And this has been recognized by this court in United States versus Flores Montano, where this court noted that the government's interest in protecting against the entry of unwanted persons and effects is at its zenith at the international border. And Your Honors, returning to the search of Ms. Geralaman's genetic information in the 23andU database, here, the government agents properly accessed this information because the information they accessed was contained in a commercial DNA database where all of the information within that database fell under the third party doctrine. Petitioner errs in suggesting that this court's ruling in Carpenter versus United States is applicable to the present case for three main reasons. First, the narrowness of the Carpenter decision. Second, the court's concern with voluntariness. And third, the quantity and quality of the information at issue in Carpenter compared to this case. As to the narrowness concern, in Carpenter, this court specifically noted that that was intended to be a narrow decision solely construed to the facts at issue in that case. So are you suggesting that contrary to your adversaries, we should not abandon the third party doctrine in light of the technological advances that the court was focused on? In Carpenter. Is that what you're arguing? Correct, Your Honor. And in fact, in Carpenter, this court noted that the third party doctrine remains a viable means for, through which the government can obtain information. And that brings me to this court's concern with voluntariness in Carpenter. In that case, this court noted that when an individual uses a cell phone, they don't voluntarily convey location data continuously to the cell service provider. But, Your Honors, that same concern is simply not present here. 
as the record reflects on pages six and seven, that Ms. Jeralaman took an affirmative step to seek out the services of 23andU, to send in a buccal swab of her DNA, and to click a disclaimer, as seen on page 19 of the record, acknowledging her allowing the company to sell her information to third parties. These would, all- Would you not agree, though, that there is an interest in maintaining privacy in your medical records, your medical conditions? You're saying here she voluntarily disclosed it to this entity. Um, what about ZocDoc.com? That's, a, that's an entity whereby you can make um, appointments to see your doctor, and it requires the disclosure of certain information. Would you argue that because you are making that disclosure voluntarily that there, they, the government could just go and get that information without any warrant or anything? Two points to that, Your Honor. First, there is a distinction to be made between the medical data at issue in this case and typical types of medical records that are covered by HIPAA. Here, we just have a single piece of identifying information about a diagnosis. The government did not view actual medical reports, and Ms. Jeralaman did not submit her uh, diagnosis information to a doctor or a hospital. She submitted it to a commercial entity, as seen on page 7 of the record. And to your honor's hypothetical about a website in which patients would have to enter some sort of diagnosis information or symptoms, I'm assuming based on your honor's hypothetical, that might be a harder question for this court, considering that that information would later be accessed by doctors and potentially have more of a relation to documents that would be covered by HIPAA. But that's not what we have in this particular case. The record does show that the government agents here only received the information over the phone, only received the name of the person involved. Does that really matter what form they received it in? I mean, it would be the same if they emailed them. I think that to me sounds like we don't want a written record of this. Not necessarily, Your Honor. Here, although the record does show that the FBI contacted an ex-agent who currently worked at 23andU, the way that the search actually transpired was uh, was fine considering the fact that that individual checked with legal counsel at 23andU before running the search and confirmed that the search would be within the company's policy. In I'm having I'm difficulty with your argument is I can see this if you put your DNA into one of these databases and you find relatives, right? And so I can enter DNA, public, member of the public, and if there's a match, I get a match back. And you understand that when you put your DNA in. But this was going, as you said, behind the scenes to a former colleague to say, you know, could you just run this on a diagnosis basis? I have trouble seeing the analogy there, that, that this is consent in some way. Your Honor, it is a different circumstance from the hypothetical you presented. However, because Ms. Jeralaman took the step to submit her buccal swab to this company, she took the risk, as indicated by this court's opinions in United States versus Miller and in Smith versus Maryland, that that information could potentially be exposed to a third party. And that's exactly what happened here. Did she take the risk, really, that her name would be revealed to a third party? Or did she take the risk only that her you, she would be included in some statistical analysis, that without names and an identification would be sold to third parties? Your Honor, the record does not reflect the specific language of the disclaimer at issue here, but regardless, Your Honor's question goes to an important point, which is that here, regardless of whether or not Ms. Jeralaman had a subjective expectation of privacy that the information would not reach the government, this court looks at whether or not that is an expectation that society would recognize as reasonable, as stated in United States versus Katz. But wouldn't the government, that analogy would be the government could say, how many people do you have in there that has this particular disease? Here they're identifying you with this, which again, seems very different to me. Your Honor, it is different. And as Your Honor noted during opposing counsel's argument, here we have DNA being used to make an identification of a suspect, just as it was in Maryland versus King. Although that case involved police booking procedures, arguably a different context than what we have here, 
Still, this court noted that when DNA is used as an identifying tool, it is no different from a fingerprint or a photograph. And would, here... Would your argument be different if it wasn't Ashwell's, which is a pretty rare disease, but let's say it was the BRCA1 gene or sickle cell anemia, and the um, company was asked to identify all the people with that um, particular trait. Would you still say that's fine, the government is entitled to get that and then can go out and, you know, investigate and interview each and every one of these, these people who presumably would be a much larger number? Potentially, Your Honor, if every one of those individuals submitted a buccal swab to 23andU, just like Ms. Jeralaman, they would have taken the risk that the information could be exposed to, to the government. However, as Your Honor suggested, it would likely be rare that the government would do a search based on just one of those criteria, just based on the sheer number of individuals who would likely come up in that search. So then, so then the government might go back and say, okay, now we have, oh, that brought back a lot more people than we thought. Now give us uh, a, data, a spreadsheet that shows each of these people, uh, lists them according to age and home address and birth date so that we can use that information to identify. Now that might be moving a little farther down a scale, but we're still in the same category that you say is okay. Your Honor, correct. That would be moving into a diff more difficult question for the court to answer. And if the address information and that sort of personal identifying information was part of the initial profile submitted to 23andU, the third party doctrine would likely still apply. But if not, there would be a line to be drawn there. Turning now to the search of Ms. Jeralaman's cell phone at the United States border, this court should not impose a reasonable suspicion requirement for forensic searches of digital devices because such searches are routine searches of pieces of property. But it's, As, it's, it's hard to see how it's routine if you need to take it off site and have it for 16 days and call in cryptologists and how is that, how is that a border search? Even? Because, Your Honor, when this court looks at the distinction between a routine search and a non-routine search, we look at whether or not there is an indignity perpetrated against a traveler that moves the initial customs interaction from a routine interaction to a non-routine interaction. But given, but given the amount of information, personal information on a cell phone, I mean, isn't that in and of itself a... a a true intrusion into someone's privacy, maybe even more than an x-ray for, you know, swallowed bodies? Potentially, Your Honor, a cell phone can contain a lot more information than a person could potentially have on their physical body, but the test of whether or not an indignity is perpetrated, that label of non-routine has only ever been applied to searches of the physical person which makes sense considering that the person is cloaked with constitutional protections that simply aren't present when it comes to searches of property. And based on that distinction, the search of the digital device here should be considered a routine search. Have you and read Riley versus California? Yes, Your Honor. Doesn't uh, Riley equate uh, to a large extent what's in a cell phone to the sanctity of the space in and around a body? It does, Your Honor. However, Riley involved a search incident to arrest and did not touch on the border search doctrine right. at all. Riley, Riley took the circumstance that was being litigated and analyzed whether or not it was reasonable on the Fourth Amendment to allow a warrantless search given the purposes of the event, uh, search incident to arrest. To what extent do you have to observe that same limitation and... Uh, uh, ask us to analyze the reasonableness of the search under the purposes of a border search. As your honors noted during opposing counsel's argument, a border search is concerned with protecting national security and ensuring that dangerous contraband doesn't come into the United States. And right, here- Right, and it's, but really, what's, what dangerous contraband could someone possibly store inside a cell phone? Other than child pornography. Your Honor, I was just about to point this court to the 11th Circuit's decision in United States versus Tousset, which demonstrates a perfect example of what sort of dangerous contraband can be contained on a digital device. And the rule asked that the petitioners are asking for would create a dangerous loophole that would allow criminals that have the technologically, technological know-how to encrypt information and hide information on a digital device 
to avoid scrutiny at the border and to bring material like child pornography into the country. What limitation then, if it's not reasonable suspicion for this type of search? You know, people are getting off a plane from a certain destination and CBP officer thinks, you know, this just doesn't look right to me. Give me your cell phones. Takes 20 cell phones off that plane. That's okay? Potentially, Your Honor, because those searches would would be covered as routine property searches, and this court can and should observe the existing distinction between searches of a person and searches of property. Is it really well, such a hurdle in, in this day and age to say, given the information that are in the border systems, the intelligence information that's gathered, observations at the border, that you need this level of reasonable suspicion to take someone's phone off-site for whatever weeks and then put their information into some anonymous, you know, some general investigative database. Your Honor, reasonable suspicion is not an appropriate standard here based on the changing nature of criminal contraband. As noted by the 11th Circuit, as the advent of technology brings in new ways to conceal criminal behavior, so too should the government be able to respond to that threat and conduct searches of devices like the one at issue in this case in order to best protect national security. Thank you. And your team number, ma'am? 15. 15? Yes. Good evening, Your Honors. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Miranda Rowley, and I represent the respondent, the United States of America. Parties should not be able to skirt the federal rules in order to get unreliable evidence in front of the jury. Accordingly, respondent respectfully requests that this court affirm the decision of the 14th Circuit for the following two reasons. First, that federal rule of evidence 106 by its text does not allow the introduction of oral statements. Isn't that form over substance, really? I mean, you have a 302 here. It's a statement of the witness to an FBI agent. What's the difference between that and a statement? Because, Your Honor, taking a step back and looking at what petitioner is asking this court to admit, it's not the 302 report. It's Mr. Rapstall's version of what Mr. Rolliman told him outside of that statement. And that's the unreliability. And that's here. always a problem with a 302 statement of that kind. So if we follow your rule, wouldn't it be encouraging law enforcement to do 302s rather than written statements? Because why would I want to risk the exculpatory material coming in? No, Your Honor, it would not because those, that 302 report is indeed hearsay. But even then, it would not encourage them to only do 302 reports. They would still have these written statements to take Why? In. Why would I do that if I think you're going to say something exculpatory? I'll put it in a 302 and then you can't use it in court. Because, Your Honor, here, Mr. Rapstall was not making exculpatory statements about himself, but about Mr. Rolliman. And it's not necessarily whether or not it would encourage these people to do 302 versus written police statements. It's whether or not the rule itself would extend to hearsay statements or oral statements itself. And well, here if, if, following up on my colleague's question, if the agent here had recorded with a tape recorder Mr. Rapstall's statements, would you then say, yes, 106 applies and the whole thing should have come in? No, Your Honor, because it was double hearsay and there would still have to be a hearsay exception to the first half of that statement where Mr. Rapstall claims Mr. Rolliman made those exculpatory statements to him, and here there is no hearsay exception. Before. So your concern is more with the hearsay inherent in this particular piece of evidence than it is with the distinction between oral and recorded? The concern is largely with the hearsay portion, Your Honor, but it also lies with the oral, with the limits that the advisory committee has placed on the rule. And it is important to note that the advisory committee on two separate occasions had the opportunity to amend the rule to include oral statements and hearsay statements. The first in 2002, as shown on the meeting notes at page four, they voted unanimously not to amend the rule. And again, most recently in April of 2018, as shown on page seven, 27, again, voted unanimously not to amend the rule. But and counsel, let's say I'm the judge and I, 
get one of these motions. Council raises this argument and it says, under 106, this is necessary to avoid misleading the jury. And that's actually true. It is. But now under your rule, if it's a hearsay statement, the judge has no discretion to let that in unless it satisfies one of the other admissibility criteria. Yes, Your Honor, and this has been the finding of the majority of circuits who've recognized whether or not Rule 106 would render inadmissible evidence admissible. Specifically, the second- and There's no judicial override for that. If, if I'm presiding over a trial and the government has used this evidence in a way that I think really misleads the jury and could be cleared up with this other part of the statement, let's assume it's written, but I, I say, you know, my hands are tied. Your Honor, here a petitioner would contend 611A, but it is important to note that, that the defendants have the opportunity to present it in their case in chief or on cross-examination in some, some cases. But here, looking at the facts before this court, petitioner has not pointed to where the misleading impression has incurred, rather has only claimed it has happened. But looking to the record specifically, as shown on pages 34, 35, and 36, it was only referencing Mr. Rapstall himself and his knowledge. And but our no rule would be for every case. That is, our rule would be for my case. That may be true, Your Honor, and that's precisely the issue, is that this rule goes in every cases. And for example, the Sixth Circuit in United States versus Costner recognized that when this loophole is created, it has the potential to harm defendants. Specifically there, Costner admitted a, the defendant admitted a writing for a non-hearsay purpose to reflect a witness's uh, memory of the event. The government used a 106 application to get the hearsay remainder of that writing in before the jury. And that in contained prior bad acts of the defendant by the witness and was used to prejudice the defendant. It is also important to note that there was a jury instruction there and the Sixth Circuit recognized that that was not enough to limit the harm that was done. And this is why the circuits, including the second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and eighth have all found that Rule 106 does not render otherwise inadmissible evidence admissible. And, and what do you understand the, the problem with this inadmissible evidence to be? In other words, why is it so dangerous? Because, Your Honor, M Petitioner and Mr. Alleman here are contending that that statement is indeed true and trying to present that for the jury as true. But it is unreliable, and we do not know if that conversation between Mr. Rapstall and Mr. Alleman actually took place and if those were her exact words. So presenting that in front of the jury or allowing other hearsay statements in front of the jury risks misleading them and undermines the purpose of Rule 106 itself. Furthermore, Your Honor, I would like to point out a couple clarifications. You're talking now about the hearsay level that is from the uh, the witness, not the, not the defendant. Yes, it would be the witness, Your Honor, because the defendant's statements went to the witness, and then the witness told Agent Remsen, so it is a double hearsay statement. But to clarify a couple points that Petitioner made, first, the case of United States versus Tome, he stated that this court applied the common law on their own, but that is not the case. A reading of Tome indicates that they deferred to the advisory committee in regards to 801 DB, where there the advisory committee did not indicate that the common law didn't apply and recognized that this court gives great weight to the advisory committee. And returning to my first point briefly, it is important to note that the advisory committee to the rule, notes to the rule, indicate that this rule does not apply to conversations for practical reasons. And to answer a question Justice Few had in Petitioner's case, where the line was drawn, the Seventh Circuit case of United States versus Prince shows that there a defendant tried to get a three-year-old statement in an FBI interview in to provide context for a statement that occurred three years later. And that's the risk of allowing oral statements in, is that there is no line, and that defendants or even prosecutors in some cases can argue that those statements would somehow provide context or should be admitted for fairness. It is important to note that petitioner has not offered what fairness means in this instance or how the court should evaluate it. Well, they didn't get, the defendant get, didn't get a chance to argue that in front of the district court because the district court actually excluded it on two principles of law. That is true, Your Honor, because it was based on the reasoning that Rule 106 didn't allow this evidence and also it didn't render inadmissible evidence. So, the, so the district court never allowed itself to the point where it would weigh whether or not context was needed in order to properly understand the evidence that was offered by the government. 
Your Honor, because it didn't have to get to that distinction. But here, petitioner doesn't tell this court how fairness should be evaluated going forward. Rather, the federal rules themselves were designed in a way to ascertain fairness and the best method for the truth and why they should be observed in cases like this. Following up on the Chief Justice's question, so maybe one way to look at it is, if you're wrong on the law, and it isn't an oral statement exclusion and you don't need another admissibility base, then it's an abuse of discretion as a matter of law. If we are wrong on the law, Your Honor, no, because here the district court didn't abuse its discretion based on the advisory committee notes but how could it? How could we say that if there, the district court was under a misimpression of the law? If this court finds that the district court did misapply the law, then yes, potentially there could have been an abuse of discretion. But here the district well, there'd court- There'd be an error of law. It wouldn't, uh, wouldn't need to get to an abuse of discretion. Yes, pardon your honor. Yes, you're correct, Chief Justice, that it would be an error of the law. But here the district court did not in misapply or misinterpret the law as it stands today because Rule 106 is clear and the advisory committee has made clear today that one, Rule 106 doesn't allow the introduction of oral statements, and two, even if this court were to find that it, that via 611A, oral statements could come in, it does not render otherwise inadmissible evidence admissible. And to briefly re um, respond to petitioner's characterization of Rainey, Rainey did not explicitly state that the common law doctrine of completeness continued to operate independently. And in fact, Rainey was a different context, as Justice Pollock noted. It was in the civil context. But more than that, it was in the context of a writing and not an oral statement and not a hearsay statement. Furthermore, Rainey indicates the importance of using traditional tools of statutory interpretation in order to interpret the meaning and intent behind the federal rules. And that means looking to the text and the intent of the legislator who designed the federal rules itself. And as the legislator has made clear on two separate occasions, in 2002 and in 2018, the rule was designed and the rule would not be amended to include oral statements or to allow the results of otherwise inadmissible evidence. Furthermore, it is important to note that two circuits petitioner relies on for their oral statement contention and in finding that oral statements should be admitted, draw the line at inadmissible hearsay, specifically the Second Circuit in United States versus Terry and the Seventh Circuit in United States versus Lee. Furthermore, it is important to note that of the circuits who have dealt with the inadmissible hearsay contention, oh, three of them, their preeminent cases deal with instances where prosecutors were using the, this loophole to get that evidence in against dependents. Costner in the Sixth Circuit, as I alluded to earlier, Woolbright in the Eighth Circuit, and Lear Morales in the Ninth Circuit. To take Wool. Thank you for your concern about the defendants. <laughs> your Honor, it's not just the concern for the defendants, but also the government cases in here. For an example, where, where here defendants were attempting to get self serving statements in front of the jury, this court should look to the first, Fourth Circuit case, United States versus Wilkinson where there the agent was testifying about finding the um, bait money in the car and the defendant tried to elicit remainders of that statement where he indicated how it came to be there. But the government found that though tacitly relevant, it was not directly on point to the testimony that was being elicited there that the bait money was there and not where it came from. And here too, though tacitly relevant, the remaining portions of the Rapstall statement about Mr. Rolliman's knowledge, they are not exactly on point to the testimony that was occurring by Agent Remsen as shown on pages 35 of the record. There, the testimony only related to Remsen's knowledge, Remsen's um, holding of the briefcase, and what, was, what he believed to be in Mr. Rolliman's briefcase. She was not mentioned in that interaction only to identify her as the defendant. And here, petitioner has not pointed to where the abuse has actually occurred in this case. Furthermore, your honors, to allow inadmissible evidence in under this rule would create a separate problem of reliability because then a separate part of trial would be determining whether or not this statement actually occurred. It is true that here we do have the 302 report, your, uh, Justice Garcia, but that would not be the case in all cases. There would not be a memorialization of the conversation and to allow a defendant or, or a government witness to get on the stand to include the remainder of the oral statement could be a Trojan horse to get self-serving statements in front of the jury that then cannot be limited. Maybe we could interpret 
written to be memorialized? This court could interpret it to be memorialized, but that would still not solve the hearsay problem of the statement that Mr. Ra that Mr. Rapstall claims Mr. Rolliman made to him, because that statement itself is not verifiable. And for these reasons, Your Honor, we respectfully request that this court affirm the decision of the 14th Circuit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honors, I have three points in rebuttal. First, Justice Pollack asked the government about ZocDoc, uh, an online service whereby patients can talk to their doctors. And there, the government made a distinction between a commercial entity and a service that is more like a traditional medical record. But that's what the kind of distinction that Carpenter holds does not hold up in the era of rapidly evolving technologies and where the third party doctrine is going to require greater scrutiny. Moreover, traditional doctor's offices, and indeed ZocDoc, is a commercial entity. Sprint was a commercial entity. And this court rejected that exact argument by the government uh, as a way of accessing commercial records. Second, the government said that 23 and you provided Ms. Duralman's name to the government simply for identification purposes, and that the government's search was only for identification. It was nothing more than a search aligned with Marilyn V. King. But Marilyn V. King specifically contemplates the issues that arise when medical diagnoses are used to identify individuals, and that there is a heightened privacy interest in that kind of private information. Finally, the government made a distinction between highly intrusive searches of persons and highly ser intensive searches of property. But that does not hold up under this court's reasoning in Riley. Yes, they are different contexts, but it is the same cell phone on the same pocket. And for that reason, this court should reverse the holdings of the 14th Circuit. Thank you. Great job. To turn it over now to Professor Arnold, who is going to hand out the first award tonight. Hi. So my name is uh, Cameron Arnold, and I'm one of the faculty advisors to the Prince Competition. And uh, on occasion, we take the opportunity to honor certain exceptional individuals who have contributed to the Prince competition with a, the Jerome Prince Lifetime Achievement Award, or as we affectionately call it, the Princey. Today, I am honored to present this award to someone who truly epitomizes the character and scholarship of the late Jerome Prince, and that person is Judge Stephen Gold. <laughs> Since fall 2015, it's been that long, Judge Gold has served as faculty advisor to the Prince competition, supervising the team of gifted, or teams of gifted students who create the problem and the bench brief for the competition. I'm also going to tell you a little bit about his day job and some of his other achievements. Um, since 1993, Judge Gold has served as a United States Magistrate Judge for the Eastern District of New York. He received his BA from Wesleyan University and his JD from Yale Law School. After graduating from Yale Law School, Judge Gold served as a law clerk to the United States District Court Judge Herbert F. Murray of the District of Maryland. 
He then worked as an associate at the law firm of Orens, Elson, and Lupert before becoming an assistant United States attorney for the Eastern District of New York, where he eventually rose to the position of deputy chief of the criminal division. In 1990, he became general counsel for the Department of Investigation of the City of New York, where he served until his appointment to the bench. In addition to serving as a magistrate judge, Judge Gold also spent over a decade and a half teaching trial advocacy as an adjunct professor at Brooklyn Law School. Four years ago, after our beloved Bob Pittler passed away, Dean Stacy Kaplow, who is faculty advisor to the Moot Court Honor Society, made the inspired decision to ask Judge Gold to step in as faculty advisor to the Prince competition. Thank God he said yes. He was a fantastic choice. He was the right choice. We have been so lucky to have him, and I've been honored to serve next to him as his co-pilot for the last four years. The Prince competition has been extremely fortunate to benefit from Judge Gold's brilliant legal mind, his expertise on the pressing evidentiary issues facing the federal judiciary, and his phenomenal writing abilities. In the classroom, he's been an engaging and exciting teacher and a patient and judicious editor. I am certain that because of Judge Gold, every student that has served on the Prince writing team has left the team a better writer, a better editor, and perhaps most importantly, a better critical thinker. I know that I have. Judge Gold is also one of the nicest, most decent people I have ever met, and he's got a great sense of humor. The some no-name bar and Westnick mugs were his idea. <laughs> Judge Gold, Brooklyn Law School, the Moot Court Honor Society, the Prince Competition, Aaron, and I are all so grateful for all you have given us over these last four years. Thank you. We are also grateful to Sue Gold, Judge Gold's wife, who is equally amazing, <laughs> for sharing him with us over these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours, including some of these evenings where the editing sessions ran well past 10 PM. Thank you, Sue. Judge Gold, on behalf of all of us in this room, as well as all of the students who you've impacted in years prior. We are proud to recognize your immense contribution to this special, in this special and permanent way. Please come up and accept this award. <laughs> Sneaky guy. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, congratulations to Prince Gold, who's going to acquire a new title. Um, and thanks, Professor Arnold, for your remarks. Um, I'm the, the person who had the inspiration to ask uh, Judge Gold to uh, be the faculty advisor to the Prince competition, and I would echo Professor Arnold's remarks that it was a good idea, um, if I do say so. i also like to congratulate myself for, at the same time, <laughs> having the inspiration to ask Professor Arnold to be a faculty advisor to the Moot Court Honor Society. So if, Professor Gold, uh, if Judge Gold's recruitment was inspired, so was Professor Arnold's. Um, and uh, as all of you who've ever worked with him or observed him at work know that he jumped wholeheartedly into the Prince universe at the same time and has been working his heart out for the last four years. Um, Professor Arnold doesn't realize that this is the year in which we're honoring two princes, and he is also going to receive one of our uh, really important awards, the Prince <laughs> Award. So like Judge Gold, Professor Arnold has um, burned the midnight oil, has dedicated countless hours to mentor the st and assist our student writing teams, but has also never for a moment forgotten that the success of, an, of a big event like this uh, requires a grown-up. 
And he's been that grown up for all of the students in the Moot Court Honor Society who participated in the Prince competition and made it the, the fabulous event that it has always been. Um, Professor Arnold has ensured the success of the competition in, in and out, and rumor has it that he has never missed a single minute of the Prince competition since he joined, starting from the welcome to the closing ceremonies. Um, he's, his love and dedication to the uh, Prince competition are visible to just everybody who's ever been involved with it. And since we're, on, we're, we're including these long-suffering family members of our princes today, um, I'd say that he probably has uh, uh, maybe at this point worn out the patience of his wife, Danielle, and children. Um, but they tolerated his late-night prince sessions and his general fretting about uh, the competition with great understanding. So we're truly appreciative of his tireless efforts, his generous spirit, his scholarship, his collegiality, and as one of his his colleagues on the faculty, I can uh, attest that uh, there's never a, uh, a, a downbeat moment in his, in his life. Uh, Professor Arnold, on behalf of all of us at Brooklyn Law School, we're proud to recognize your contributions to the Prince What a delight for us to be able to fill this role. Um, I was uh, so pleasantly astonished by how well each of the four of you did. The level of your preparation was outstanding. The, your ability to recall specific facts and page numbers and comments in cases was, was a level of preparation and performance that I wish I could take back with me to South Carolina and share with the lawyers who practice in front of, in front of our court. Um, one of the things that I think is so hard to do in oral argument, which really is the thing that is so hard to do in the practice of law, is to be able to take that, that level of preparation that you have given yourself and in real time translate it into the conversation that is taking place in a meaningful way. It's, it's often so difficult to be able to process those movements, uh, intellectual movements, and each of the four of you, I thought, did a very good job with that very difficult task. And again, I just want to say what an honor it is to have been here and, uh, and participate in this. Thanks. Um, one, all of you were terrific, really. Um, it was a great argument. I echo those last remarks. I mean, just to give one example, you didn't do things that really bother me when I'm on the bench. You know, when I, when I you give a hypothetical, you twist the facts a little bit, you know, inevitably you get back, but that's not our case as the first response, which drives me crazy. And you all didn't do that. You went with the questions. You were responsive. Um, you really showed great poise uh, in, in, in your arguments. And, and command the facts and the cases, which is key. Um, you know, everybody's nervous in arguments. That, that's normal. I, I think people Even tell the you. Even judges. Yeah. <laughs> people tell you they're not and don't believe them. Um, and I think you were, you know, your demeanor was appropriate. Um, you were respectful. You know, as you do more arguments, and this is a different kind of environment, but, you know, you can be a little more conversational at times, but it's better to be more formal than, than less, obviously, to err on that side. And I thought you had a very nice tone um, all around. So uh, I applaud you all. I thought it was really, I, I do these, I'm, I'm sure my colleagues do as well. And I thought this was really a terrific argument. I can only echo what they've both said. Um, you know, I've done the Prince Moot Court competition many years now. And um, I have to say, you guys were stellar. You were just marvelous. And you were beyond poised. You had a nice 
sense of demeanor in responding to some difficult, almost nasty questions from some of us. And, um, and, and you handled them with such grace that um, I, I was truly impressed. And I only wish half of the lawyers who appeared before me were as well prepared and knew their cases as, as you all did. So congratulations on a, on a really great job done. Now I'm gonna jump in here just for a moment. I rarely get to cut off the chief judge uh, and three judges, um, but I am the dean of Brooklyn Law School this year, and before they go any further, sorry to keep the suspense, uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about our final round judges um, and also about the other participants in the competition, and I promise I'll be very brief. I'll only talk about the extreme highlights of their many credentials. Um, but uh, I do want, want you to know who the judges are and what, uh, how thankful we are to them for their time. Sitting closest to me, uh, uh, Judge Michael Garcia is a Brooklyn native, and we always like that here at Brooklyn Law School. Um, <laughs> He was nominated to the Court of Appeals of New York by Governor Cuomo and confirmed by the New York State Senate in February 2016. He received his undergraduate degree with honors from the State University of New York at Binghamton. Then he traveled south to uh, Virginia for a Master's of Arts from William and Mary. And then he came back up to New York for a law degree. You won't be surprised to hear this. Summa cum laude, valedictorian from Albany Law School. Uh, he has served in many, many important positions, including the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York. He was a partner at Kirkland and Ellis, Assistant Secretary of Commerce, uh, Assistant Secretary of Immigration and Customs Enforcement. I'm skipping over some. The Vice President of the Americas for Interpol, and this is the one that intrigues me the most, uh, Chair of the Investigatory Chamber of the Ethics Committee of the Federation Internazionale de Football Association. <laughs> Uh, and we are so thankful to have him here, one of our New York uh, judges, uh, spending this time with you and, and devoting his energies to this uh, extraordinary uh, opportunity for all of our students and for all the participants. Um, next to him, uh, Judge Few from the Supreme Court of the State of South Carolina, where he also entered service in 2016. Uh, and prior to that, he was Chief Justice of the South Carolina Court of Appeals uh, starting in 2010. And before that, he served as a trial judge on the circuit court in South Carolina for nearly 10 years. So he's been at every level of the judicial system. Uh, a little known fact to me until I figured it out last night, uh, he and I both went to the same undergraduate school, which was the one that just barely survived in March Madness last night. Uh, uh, not only did he go to Duke, but he, unlike me, was actually, I understand, the Duke athletic mascot. Uh, so, <laughs> so we have this kind of, you know, sports thing going on today with you. Judge Pollock, I'm sure you're going to come in, too. Uh, he went to the uh, South Carolina Law School, where he was um, an active member of the student body, uh, and he, where he uh, continues to teach. He's also received an honorary a law degree from Charleston Law School, and he's an award-winning public speaker uh, uh, with many uh, pearls of wisdom to share to us, and we're going to hear a few more of them in just a moment. Uh, and then farthest from me, uh, but closest actually geographically, is Magistrate Judge Cheryl Pollock, and she's closest because she's the uh, a magistrate judge on the Eastern District of New York, and the courthouse is three blocks from here. Um, and she's been one of the inaugural members of the Brown Bag Lunch Series between Brooklyn Law School students and judges in the Eastern District, uh, which has been a wonderful opportunity for our students uh, to uh, feel closer uh, to the court and see the court in its many different manifestations. Um, before becoming a judge, uh, Judge Pollock was assist an assistant United States attorney for the Eastern District of New York. Uh, like Steve Gold uh, a moment ago, she was also deputy chief of the criminal division. She was chief of narcotics. She's done many other things, uh, including being uh, 
in the, this is, see if I got this right, the International Affairs and National Security Coordinator for the U.S. Attorney's Office. So she uh, certainly had some of your, uh, your problems, interests uh, firsthand as, as uh, when she was in, uh, an assistant U.S. attorney. And I'm sure that uh, came in into her thoughts about the problem tonight. Uh, she is an active member of the Association of the City of Bar of the City of New York, the ABA. She's a member of a number of important committees, she chairs the Eastern District CJA panel committee, ha has been a member of the Eastern District Advisory Committee on Civil Practice in Rules, hence the rules uh, issue. Uh, and she's also served uh, for the Federal Bar Council as a master in the Inns of Court. And those are just the highlights. I forgot to say that between the New Yorker and the South Carolinian, she ventured as far as New Jersey, where she went to Princeton, uh, and then went out west to Chicago uh, for law school. So we're trying to uh, expand our geographical perspective here. Turning for just a moment to you, uh, we're so grateful to all the 130 uh, participants in the 30, 38th uh, annual 34th. So I'm looking forward to four years from now. The 34th uh, annual uh, evidence moot court competition here at Brooklyn Law School. We are so happy to have 36 law schools from, uh, I believe, 16 different states plus the District of Columbia. Uh, I hope next year we'll be up to half the states. Uh, we're glad to tell you, and you, some of you may have had a chance to meet each other already, uh, that the teams come from far and wide. Uh, the furthest, uh, the longest distance award goes to the Hastings team, which traveled about 3,000 miles. Uh, and the shortest distance and, and maybe best neighbor award goes to New York Law School, which traveled about three miles. Uh, and on the average, you traveled 780 miles to get here to display your oral advocacy uh, and your uh, competence at research and at, uh, and at writing, all of which we congratulate you for heartily. I also want to pay homage to the 155 other judges for these uh, competition rounds this year. The alumni and faculty who participated, other judges from New York who participated. We couldn't do such a wonderful program without them. Uh, and I look forward to those of you who are Brooklyn Law School students sitting in the audience to your return as judges in future years. And for those of you who aren't Brooklyn Law School students, we really look forward to your return as uh, competitors, as coaches, and as alumni. Because once you, you come to Brooklyn uh, for the Prince Memorial Competition, you're lifelong members of our community, and we look forward to staying in touch with you. So thanks for letting me uh, intervene for just a moment and uh, exert the decanal prerogative over the judges. Uh, but now uh, let me turn it back to the judges for the, the, the best part of the evening. Do you think it's necessary to clear up that I'm not originally from Brooklyn? <laughs> they have very strong powers of deduction here in the audience. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> making a decision in a case is easy when you can make the decision on the basis of the merits of the case. It's really tough to make a decision as to who wins when it's uh, based on how well such excellent performers have done. Uh, but the first placed winning team is Team 15 from the University of California Hastings College of Law. You come on up. You come on up. Just step in front of the judges and stand to the side. And you mentioned the audience's powers of deduction, so there shouldn't be much suspense left that the second place team is the Georgetown University Law Center. Southern. 
And it is our collective pleasure to announce that the winner of Best Oralist in the final rounds is Laura Anderson. Congratulations. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, my name is Erin Callahan, and I'm the 2019 uh, Prince Coordinator for this year. And I just want to say thank you uh, to the three of you for all of your wisdom and grace for being here today. There is a small token um, from Dean Fullerton and myself and the entire society, and I hope that you do enjoy those and very much appreciate your help, and we may be recruiting you in future years. <laughs> so turning back to what I know all of you are excited about in the audience, um, we're going to move immediately to the best oralist in the preliminary rounds. And that goes to Joseph Sternberg from Team 10, the University of Georgia Law School. I'm pausing again. So before we go to the best briefs, um, I just want to take a moment. I want to thank each of you, the teams, the coaches, the competitors. I feel like, again, we've been dating online for about six months. Um, so it has been a very exciting time, and I feel incredibly fortunate to have met you and to have witnessed what you have brought to the game. So incredibly appreciative of that. Um, what I will say about this Prince competition is you've seen that it's an all-hands-on-deck effort. And none of this would be possible without Dean Marianne uh, Fullerton, Mary Ellen Fullerton, um, who is still here, or did she step out? Oh, this one up here. See, there's this thing. I know that she likes to lead from behind, um, but we're going to bring you out for one second, if you don't mind. A very small token of our appreciation. We are hoping that when the summer comes and you have a little bit more time to yourself, you may enjoy tea for two, high afternoon tea for two at the Pierre. <laughs> and, and if your husband does not want to go, we have lots of people who do. But thank you for thank everything. You I very appreciate much. it. Yeah. Thank you for thank everything. You. And as you can imagine, um, we have about 130 Moot Court Honor Society participants on both the trial side and the uh, appellate side who have come together. Um, we are a large, rowdy, and complex group. Um, and with a team on the road just about every weekend um, from about October on, budget, logistics, team concerns, all of these things, the room assignments, um, we could not do these on our own. Uh, we are a student organization. We are only empowered by the people who empower us. And I want to say a special thanks um, to Dean Stacy Kaplow. If you wouldn't mind coming forward for one second. Um, she keeps the... <laughs> Thank you very much. Good call. <laughs> um, yes. Dean Kaplow, seriously, she does keep things running year after year after year, um, and she's been a champion to everything that we are, have been able to do here. So for your patience and expertise, thank you. So. And kind of amazing what a year can bring. So uh, 12 months ago, I did not know Beth Palastro. So Beth Palastro um, has kind of been living in my pocket for a while now. Um, she's been my go-to person for absolutely everything Prince. Um, she was a 2015 recipient of the Prince Award, um, and she's truly the glue that holds this competition together. Um, 47 days from now, who's counting? I will be graduating. Um, but Beth is miraculously going to take everything that worked this year and everything that didn't and she's somehow going to put this together and start the journey of the 2020 Prince competition. And year after year, it continues to grow. So, Beth, I know you're hiding, and I know you hate me right now. Um, but I am eternally grateful for your guidance and your humor and your friendship. All right, we're turning back to you, okay? The 2019 uh, Prince competitors and coaches, um, I mentioned at the welcome meeting on Thursday that when the briefs arrived here, it was an incredibly exciting moment for us. 
um, we started to go through those and we sent them out. We had about 20 faculty members who braided those griefs. What was fascinating to me is that I expected score sheets to come back. Our faculty are incredible. They're also incredibly busy. The comments that were made about the quality of your work uh, kind of had me shaking. Like I knew what we were in for this weekend. So it was incredible to see. Um, fantastic, impressive, brilliant. Those were the words that kept repeating themselves over and over. Um, so on that note, um, we'd like to honor three of the teams whose fantastic and impressive and brilliant scores um, landed you as the top three briefs. So starting um, as the third best brief, congratulations, Team 33, American University, Washington College of Law. Our second place brief goes to Team 3, Drexel University, Thomas R. Klein School of Law. And that brings us to the best brief. Congratulations, Team 21, Georgia State University College of Law. I can't pass that down to the fourth team, sorry. Yeah. Um, in all seriousness, I do joke around a lot, um, but this has been an incredible year. Um, to each of the 36 teams, um, on behalf of myself and the Moot Court Honor Society, um, the Brooklyn Law School administration, uh, we are honored that you chose to come to Brooklyn for this competition, and we're humbled by your advocacy skills, your writing, and just your plain brilliance. Um, and we're really awed by your talent. So I thank you. I hope that we see you back coaching. I hope that we see you back in general, and you know that you always have my cell phone number somewhere on an email. So to all of you, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Luongo. I'm the president of the Moot Court Honor Society, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, so on behalf of Brooklyn Law School and the Moot Court Honor Society, I want to extend a few thank yous and acknowledgments to the people who made this year's Dean Jerome Prince Memorial Evidence Competition possible. Uh, first off, uh, of course, I would like to once again thank Judge Michael Garcia, Justice John Cannon Few, and Judge Cheryl Pollock for joining us this weekend. Uh, it, <laughs> Uh, it has been our privilege, we are very lucky to have such a distinguished panel preside over our final round today. Uh, we couldn't be more grateful uh, for the thoughtful questions that you posed and for the time you dedicated to come here today, so thank you. Uh, we'd also like to thank our Dean, uh, Mary Ellen Fullerton, for her continued support of the Moot Court Honor Society uh, and the Prince Evidence Competition. This competition and our successes are made possible by you, Dean Fullerton. Uh, we would also, of course, like to again thank Dean Stacy Kaplow, uh, who serves as the faculty advisor for the Moot Court Honor Society here, and she's just a fantastic resource for the entire executive board. So thank you both. Uh, the Prince Evidence Competition uh, and the Moot Court Honor Society rely on several administrators here at Brooklyn Law School who keep the society running smoothly all year long, and especially this very hectic weekend that we just had. Uh, so I would like to specifically thank Beth Palastro, Chris Gibbons, Mike Licari, and Paul Jang, each of whom, <laughs> each of whom has been an invaluable uh, resource for us to make sure that this weekend went off without a hitch. I also want to thank some of the students at uh, Brooklyn Law School because Prince is, of course, a student-run competition. You all have seen our dedicated students this weekend all over the school. For those of you who were there at the registration meeting, uh, I mentioned that uh, every student, their top priority is making sure that you have a good experience this weekend. And I'm happy to say that uh, I think that they pulled it off. Uh, so I want to start first by thanking the Moot Court Honor Society Executive Board, who are here today. Uh, three of them uh, in the front row here, Jenna Jones, Mary Claire Kennedy, and Gracia Moon, Martin Rowe. Uh, Aaron Callahan, uh, Nikki Halluyan is uh, at a competition, and Brendan Brown, the trial coordinator specifically, is in the corner there. Uh, 
they took on any roles, any tasks that we needed to assign. Uh, they really were a tremendous resource this weekend, weekend. So thank you all. We are tremendously grateful. I'd also like to thank our Prince Committee, who handled logistics, decorations, scoring, bailiffing, judge relations. This competition would not have happened if it wasn't for the hard work that our committee uh, put in over the past month. And all the members of the 132-member uh, Moot Court Honor Society who worked shifts at Prince, who were there to help make this go off smoothly. So thank you all. I now need to turn to the people who wrote the problem. Uh, five students, uh, John Crane, Amanda Fell, Amber Leary, Martin Rowe, and Ben Stadler. Without the hard work and dedication of these five students, we would not be here today. They have worked on this problem sin since September, spent a tremendous amount of time researching, writing, and rewriting these issues. We could not be more proud of the final product. And it was especially fun for me as the bailiff, because whenever an argument came up, they were like, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. I hadn't thought about that. So it was very nice to see that play out here today. Uh, they worked under the guidance of Professor Cameron Arnold and Judge Stephen Gold, our faculty advisors to the Prince Writing Team, uh, who worked to make sure that this problem was as great and as nuanced as it could be. So thank you all so much. If you all wouldn't mind coming down here, we have a token of our appreciation for you. And I feel bad that we're putting Martin Rowe to work, uh, and he had to give himself his own gift, so sorry. <laughs> uh, and of course, obviously, of course, we need to thank our Prince coordinator, Erin Callahan. I've seen firsthand how much work she put in behind the scene, how much time she spent on every single aspect of this competition. It is absolutely incredible. I'm just personally awed by it. She is an incredible person. Uh, so I'd like to extend our deepest thanks to Aaron for all of her efforts this weekend. So let's give Aaron a round of applause. We also have a gift for Aaron uh, that we can. Mike knows that because he was there. <laughs> uh, okay, and uh, I. Yes, so thank you all for coming so much. Uh, I hope you're all coming to the banquet. It is at 5 p.m. I'm going to have to interrupt you quickly. It's been almost a year to date since Michael has been elected as the president of Brooklyn Law School's Moot Court Honor Society. And since then, Michael's hard work has not been consistent. Um, <laughs> rather, with every passing moment, his dedication has grown tenfold. And your leadership skills, your dedication, you have been the absolute backbone of our society. So we just want to extend our deepest gratitude. Thank you for everything that you have done for us. The banquet is at 5 o'clock. No. The banquet, the final round was at 5 o'clock. <laughs> the banquet is, uh, starts at what time? 8.30. 8.30, 205 State Street on the 22nd floor. That's Fort Shelley. It's a great event space. I hope you're all, you all come. Thank you all for coming to the final round. Uh, this has been a great time. Congratulations. Congratulations.